Now I think we're getting right at the heart of what democracy is all about when uh, we're at loggerheads over who should be allowed to vote and, and who shouldn't. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer and today, is it getting harder to vote as a black person in America? In the 2012 presidential election, black voter turnout surged to 67%, but by 2020, it dropped to 63. Much of that decline was probably due to an enthusiasm gap because Barack Obama was no longer on the ticket. But some experts fear that new restrictive voting laws, primarily from Republican state legislatures, will only drive that number further down. Are these new laws really about making it harder to vote, as many progressive activists argue, or are they about making it safer to vote, as many Republicans claim? I'm joined today by syndicated Chicago Tribune columnist Clarence Page. He actually once won a Pulitzer covering voter fraud. Then with President Biden promising to elect the first black woman to the Supreme Court, we take a quick look at the history of black women on the bench. But first, Question time for you. How many suds are in a bar of soap? How many seeds are in a cucumber? How many jelly beans fit into a glass jar? You don't know. That's the point. Until 1965, black people across the Jim Crow South encountered unanswerable questions, including the ones I just mentioned, from registrars at polling places where they tried to vote. Now, the tendency was for white voters to somehow answer those questions right for black voters to get them wrong. Then there was the so-called literacy tests. Take question 48 from this 1965 Alabama test, which asks, how many votes must a person receive in order to become president if the election is decided by the US House of Representatives? Remember, there was no Google back in 1965. Or take question 27 from this 1964 Louisiana test. Write right from left to right as you see it spelled here. That seems confusing. And there was little time for befuddlement because the test, which could include upwards of 70 questions, usually had a 10 minute time limit. A single wrong answer meant a failing grade. After mounting pressure from civil rights leaders, Congress passed the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which banned literacy tests like these and other forms of overt voter suppression. But in 2013, the Supreme Court struck down a key provision of the act that required federal oversight for states with a history of racial discrimination. Such discrimination, Chief Justice John Roberts argued, was a thing of the past. Voting rights activists and progressive leaders warned that without Justice Department oversight, dozens of states would roll out increasingly restrictive voting laws targeted at minority groups. Former President Barack Obama made just this point in his eulogy to the late civil rights hero John Lewis back in 2020. We may no longer have to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in order to cast a ballot. But even as we sit here, there are those in power who are doing their darndest to discourage people from voting. And while I haven't always agreed with President Obama, there is no denying that some states are trying to make it harder to vote, particularly relative to 2020, when states went through an unusual historic expansion in voting access due to the pandemic. In 2021 alone, 19 states, mostly Republican-led, enacted 34 laws to restrict voting by bolstering voter ID laws, eliminating polling places, rolling back mail-in voting, and even banning the distribution of water bottles to voters waiting in line. But things aren't always so black and white, or really blue and red. For instance, a typically conservative state like Georgia has actually been ahead of deep blue New York in some laws that provide access, such as expansive early voting and no excuse absentee ballots. There are, in short, many reasons why black and minority voters turn out in smaller numbers, and they don't all have to do with restrictive voting laws. But despite record overall turnout in the 2020 election, the racial gap in the U.S. has persisted, with 71% of white voters casting ballots, compared to 63% of black voters. Progressive leaders worry that new voting laws will only widen that gap. Republicans would say that they're not trying to make voting harder, 
They're trying to make it safer by preventing voter fraud. But the problem with that argument and with President Trump's big lie that the 2020 election was stolen is that there's simply no evidence of widespread election fraud in American elections. The upcoming 2022 midterms will be the first major test of these new voting laws. Congressional Democrats are desperate to pass a new federal voting rights bill before Election Day, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, that would reverse that 2013 Supreme Court decision I just mentioned, but it won't make it out of the Senate. When did protecting voting become so political? And how much will these new voting laws affect black turnout in the 2022 midterms? I'm joined by syndicated Chicago Tribune columnist, Clarence Page. Clarence Page, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. So I wanna start, of course, with the Voting Rights Act. And uh, I mean, I've seen that it's been functionally blocked by all the Republicans and indirectly, I guess, by both Senators uh, Sinema and Manchin. Uh, you support it. You've said it's very important uh, that, we, that we get this done uh, for American democracy and for enfranchisement. Walk us through what it is and why it's so important. Well, the uh, Voting Rights Act is important uh, for, well, for one thing, for me personally, uh, I was coming out of high school when that Voting Rights Act was passed a year after the uh, Civil Rights Act, and it changed the lives of, of Black folks and the rest of Americans. And uh, the uh, Voting Rights Act was necessary because the Jim, the Jim Crow regime had uh, virtually taken away the right to vote for Black folks across the South. And uh, it, it was a uh, uh, very important uh, decision the Supreme Court made a few years ago by uh, t uh, taking away the uh, right to preclearance uh, from that act. Uh, that's an important word. Uh, what, what it means is that the uh, folks in the in the affected states, mainly the old Confederate states, uh, were not uh, able to make changes in any of their voting laws and regulations without preclearance by the courts. Uh, by uh, uh, lifting that uh, uh, just Justice Roberts court uh, that any future complaints would have to uh, uh, wait until after an election, not before an election. Uh, and Justice Roberts said that he uh, thought after all after almost a century, uh, there was enough uh, reform, enough changes had come about uh, in race relations uh, that uh, we didn't need it anymore. Now, is your argument um, that actually we are slipping backwards? in terms of the ability of uh, black Americans in the country um, to exercise their right to vote? Unfortunately, that appears to be the case. Uh, we certainly see a lot of the old tricks that were put together during the reconstruction period that can affect election outcomes. Now that is another bone of contention. A number of people say, well, research shows that even when uh, these various uh, measures are taken uh, to uh, that appear to be racially loaded. For example, not just the uh, voter ID, but also uh, uh, the polling places where they're located, uh, the ability to vote by mail. Uh, all, all of these uh, uh, conveniences, if you will, are, uh, tend to have an impact on the ability of a lot, a lot of people to vote. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the preponderance of evidence uh, shows that uh, the uh, Republicans tend to benefit from making it harder to vote. That's a general statement, but in general, though, the thrust of what Republicans are, are after would make it harder for uh, people to vote. Uh, the Democrats want to make it easier. Uh, now, some folks on the other side say uh, that uh, making it that easy opens you up to possibility of fraud. And voter fraud is, we've seen, has been greatly exaggerated as far as the actual occurrences of it. We've had uh, a big debate going on as to whether or not every measure should be taken to avoid fraud. Uh, and uh, now that debate's been further muddied by uh, the insistence by President Trump's campaign uh, that, uh, uh, that there was rampant fraud. Uh, and uh, now I think we're getting right at the heart of what democracy is all about. Uh, when uh, we're at loggerheads over who should be allowed to vote and, and who shouldn't. Well, when you're fighting more about how the election is held and who gets to vote than who you're voting for, uh, that is obviously a pretty flashing red sign, warning sign, that your democracy has some problems. I would say you're right. And it's, uh, it strikes right at the heart of what we're supposed to be about as Americans. Already we can see 
as well, this is going beyond the John Lewis Act, but when you've got uh, various lawsuits around the country and, and various actions at the state level, uh, going back uh, really uh, uh, to the 90s, there was a concerted e effort by uh, Republicans, and this is not a bad thing to go out at the, at the grassroots, organize people, uh, run, run candidates for, uh, for county races and school boards. Uh, that's a fine thing on paper. Uh, wh what it means, though, is you can, you can get a strategic advantage insofar as the way electoral votes are counted, uh, maps, and the redistricting that will decide uh, uh, the uh, uh, electoral vote. About two-thirds of the legislatures around the country are uh, controlled by Republicans, either the House or, or the Senate side or both. Uh, and uh, it's in those states uh, where there was a really close election this last time, uh, where we've seen real concerted efforts uh, being made to, uh, uh, for no uh, better word I can use than rig, <laughs> uh, but uh, we certainly have allegations of electors being rigged so that they will tilt in favor of the Republicans. So w if the John Lewis Act were to pass, and again, I know it does not look like it will at this point, um, w how meaningful a change how meaningful a guardrail would that present in terms of ensuring um, that American elections going forward um, would not be subject to effective claims of, um, you know, of, of rigging or dual certification, all those kind of problems that we have? We're going to have disputes over of that sort, uh, regardless of what is done. It fits a master plan without sounding too conspiratorial, but I guess there's no other way to describe it. Uh, it fits in with a master plan of, of uh, uh, making it easier for national Republicans to have uh, an impact on future presidential races. Uh, and and uh, we saw this last time, it, it was very close. Uh, and uh, the electoral votes that uh, turned up in Georgia uh, turned out to be decisive, and uh, that was good. Georgia's current situation is the result of past reforms that enable more uh, Black voters uh, to get to the polls. But at the same time, uh, they're already making some changes or they're debating uh, in Georgia about uh, further changes to the law that will um, enable the legislature to decide electoral votes uh, if there is a dispute in the count. Uh, the sort of thing that President Trump's people were trying to push uh, in this uh, past election uh, will actually be easier to accomplish. So then all that matters is uh, which party is in charge of the legislature, really. Well, yeah, uh, somebody, maybe it was Stalin, uh, said that uh, it's not uh, uh, who, who casts the vote, but who counts them. You ever heard that before? Oh, sure, of course. You don't want elections to go the route of impeachment, right? Impeachment has become completely broken. It's purely a political tool because it, it doesn't matter what the charges are. It only matters whether it's a Democrat or Republican um, that's being, uh, that the charges are being levied against and whether they control or not the House and the Senate. And, and what you're saying is that in state legislatures, we increasingly see some trends towards that type of behavior um, for elections. I can go back to uh, 1876 to the end of Reconstruction when there was a disputed national election where the, the uh, vote did come to Washington. I was heading toward the House of Representatives, which is what the Constitution says they get to, to decide in such uh, cases. And uh, each state gets uh, one vote uh, regardless of the proportion uh, of votes that were cast for each party. And uh, that uh, didn't it didn't get that far because they had uh, that grand compromise, which essentially ended Reconstruction, the hayes tolton Compromise. The North agreed to pull Union troops out of the South. Yep. And believe me, as an African-American with Alabama roots, uh, that was the end of my family's ability to vote, uh, essentially, uh, until I was in high school. And, no, and a broken election basically mm -hmm. um, led to Jim Crow, basically yeah. prevented uh, Blacks in the South uh, from experiencing liberty for generations. That's exactly right. And since we're not speaking in a public school in Virginia and a number of other states that, that are banning critical race theory, 
we can talk freely about this is one a bold example of how history still uh, history and uh, the, the slavery period and the laws that came out of that period, including the Electoral College. Uh, this is the legacy of, of those days. And, and that's part of the big argument now. Are we going to get rid of these last vestiges of discrimination from the Jim Crow era. Well, Clarence, I mean, with due difference, I mean, I don't think we're talking about critical race theory here. I just think we're talking about American history. Well, thank you. <laughs> critical race theory was a, a bogus issue, in my view, and a lot of other people, but it, it was very influential in uh, getting the Republican governor elected there. And one of his first promises now is to get critical race theory out of the schools, which isn't even in the schools. But anything that looks like critical race theory, which means black history, uh, yeah. or as they put it, anything thing that makes white children feel bad, uh, which is not accurate either. But that is uh, that uh, uh, danger is what motivated a lot of voters and uh, continues to motivate a lot of voters uh, to uh, want to get rid of critical race theory. I mean, is that what it feels like to you? Does it feel, does it feel like they want to just take black history in the United States out of the schools in Virginia? Yeah, and I'm not anti-Republican, I should point out. <laughs> in fact, my newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, helped to sponsor a young Illinois a candidate for president named Abraham Lincoln. And we've been very proud of that tradition. And I'm familiar with that history uh, back then. And I find it very ironic that I'm reliving part of that history now. It hasn't ended. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I was traumatized by Moby Dick in high school, but it doesn't stop me from going to Nantucket. I, I feel like there are too many knickers in a twist. Uh, around issues that don't really exist. We, we need our kids to just learn basic issues of our country's history. How, how can they be citizens, effective citizens and effective voters if they don't know where our country came from? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, that's exactly right. You, you know, we, we talk about being, being a democracy uh, or a democratic republic, whichever you prefer, but what does that really mean? Uh, uh, to too many of our young people, history is just uh, something that they have to uh, get a grade in so they can move on. I, I confess I was like that too a lot as, as a kid, but over time I've learned to appreciate history more and more, and I especially appreciate it right now. And when I think about how can we preserve the good things about this democratic republic that came out and are a model to the world uh, as far as democratic rule is concerned. Uh, and uh, we're fighting those old battles again. Clarence Page, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. With Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer announcing his retirement, President Biden has vowed to make good on a longstanding promise about who he's going to nominate to fill that seat. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. It's long overdue in my view. There are already a handful of names swirling around the Beltway and plenty of speculation about whether they can get through the Senate confirmation process. I personally am not that concerned about it, but let's take a moment to look back rather than ahead at the short history of black women on the bench in America. Jane Bolland was the first black woman to graduate Yale Law School in 1931 and the first black woman judge in the United States, becoming a New York State judge at the age of 31 in 1939. For 20 years, she was the only black female judge in the country. That is until Juanita Kidd Stout, an Oklahoma music teacher turned Philadelphia lawyer, became the first black woman to serve as a judge in Pennsylvania, initially at the municipal court level, then the state Supreme Court. When lawyers pleaded for leniency for their young clients, Judge Stout would show a little compassion, once snapping, we didn't have indoor plumbing until I was 13. But the woman best known for laying the groundwork for those who would follow was Judge Constance Baker Motley. She was the first black woman federal judge appointed in 1966. Motley had previously written the original complaint in Brown versus Board of Education. She was widely known as a desegregation architect who would inspire many lawyers and judges that came after her. No doubt including some of the black women on President Biden's shortlist for the next Supreme Court Justice. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, I know you do. Or if you're just interested in how to commit voting fraud in your own neighborhood, you know where to go. Take a minute. Why don't you sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter? It's called Signal.